Okay. So today is October 15th, 2021. And my name is Alexandra Cicelong Floro, and I am an oral history archivist at the Orange County Regional History Center. And today I am interviewing Jenny Rios de Caballero from Bolivia. Y Ernesto Caballero de Bolivia. And we are at um, Mrs. and Mr. Caballero's Caballero, yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> house in Altamont Springs, yes, Florida. So to start off, if you can tell me, and whoever wants to start can start, uh, when and where were you born? Yes, first. Uh, I born in Potosí, Bolivia. It is a small city in the um, occidental part of my country. Uh, and it's, a, it's located in very high altitude. Mm -hmm. um, it is a 4,000 meters over level sea. So it's very high, very cold, but it is beautiful. And I grew up there until I was uh, 16 years old. And then we moved to the tropical side of my country, that is uh, Santa Cruz, where I meet my, my husband. Yeah, I, I was born in Santa Cruz, Bolivia. Uh, that's basically the eastern part of Bolivia because it's a uh, uh, border with Brazil. We have a lot of the Amazon uh, forests, uh, ser serranias, small mountains in there. So it's about 300, 300 meters above sea level and it's hot. We are in Florida, so it's the, the weather is similar to over where I was born. And as I say, it's a lot of forests, the climate is different so from the western part. So it's beautiful too. So you didn't have much of a shock when you moved to Florida. It wasn't in terms of weather. Well, the humidity is a little bit different from there than to here. I think here is more uh, humid. No, but it's, but it's dry, so the heat affects, not affects us, but uh, yes. It's we feel more the heat here. Yes. <laughs> no. Especially in summer. <laughs> yes. So how was it to grow up? Um, in those places that you grew up, what is what are the most um, you know distinctive memories that you have from childhood? Well, the difference to hear it, uh, I mean over there, of course, uh, the childhood is we always have our friends going outside the house playing. Uh, of course, the, the food is completely different. Uh, mm, going to like my 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 family, we live in, in the city side of, the, of Santa Cruz but I have my grandmothers and grandparents living in the countryside. So with my brothers, yeah, usually every weekend, and my cousins and uh, my nephew, not nephew, but cousins and other families, we used to go every weekend to the countryside to visit my uh, grandparents, and we stay there. I mean, it's rivers and mountains and that side, a lot of forests, and it's completely different no, than for us. Yeah, in my case, it was cold but we have the, um, the opportunity to, to do a lot of activities, cultural activities. No, we don't have too much, uh, we di I didn't have too much time to, to play too much because every single day after the school I got a ballet, so I went to my ballet classes and then Sundays we went to my grandmother's home and she cooked the special Bolivian food, normally it's um, peanut soup it's delicious and all Bolivians will, will love it. Or first, of course, on Sunday, I need to remember this. We wake up and after the breakfast, we go to Mass. Coming back from Mass, we go to eat salteñas. That is the most popular of Bolivia. It's um, like empanada, but juicy. And you know, to, you know to know how to eat the salteña because it's juicy. You can eat it just like a regular empanada. You eat it with a spoon. It is a very special way to do it, but uh, every Bolivian we talk, they say, I, when I go to Bolivia, I need to eat my, my salteñas because it's just, we grow up with that one, no? So, can you find any of those in here? In Orlando and here in no, uh, there is a few uh, Bolivians that are trying to make it like it is, but uh, there are people of uh, uh, friends in Miami, in Miami, then sometimes they come, or in Tampa, and when they are close, we try to order from them. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's rare to see it here, but of course, 
uh, we say as soon as we know somebody is trying to and uh, is getting it here, we have to get some because it's, it's, it's delicious. Mm -hmm. um, what is the oldest family, um, oldest relative that you remember that you ever met growing up? <coughs> Well, I remember for a few years my grandparent from my mother's side uh, because uh, uh, he was always very quiet. I mean, I, I know him just until I was probably seven years old. He passed away in that age when I was there. But uh, he was nice to see him. He was one of the, from all our family, and when we go to the, my grandparents' house, he was the tallest one. From everybody, and even we have a couple of pictures, and every, all the families there, cousins, uh, uh, their sons, and cousins to from nephews, and he's the tallest one. Everybody's just one side, and the head is right there. No? So it's, it's, I remember him a lot. Mm -hmm. no Did you spend uh, a lot of time with him, like socializing? Did he tell you any stories of his childhood? remember any of that? Well, that's the way thing because we, we because uh, my brothers and I, we know him just very few years. Let's say, like, I think it was at about seven years when he passed away. But we always went with him or and my grandmother to the where he has the the fruit fruit uh, trees, fruit trees and everything. So every time we go there, he take us over there you know, for sugar cane or uh, mangoes, oranges, so it was nice to, to share that with him. I don't really remember that, that I was talking to him, to him because uh, he was pretty quiet, you know, but it's nice to have that, that remember. You know. yeah. And my city is so old, very, very old. Um, when the Spaniards went to Latin America, they went especially to my city because it's very famous for the big mine of uh, silver in that time. And it was so much silver, um, they just calculate they can make a bridge from South America, Potosí, this very end, the, almost close to the end of South America, to, from, uh, from there to uh, Spain. It was too much silver, too much money in that, in the time of the colony. So the architecture is very, very beautiful and old, and we have so many histories. My grandma always uh, was telling us so many tales about the, the, the people how they hide the, the gold, the, the silver in their houses. Then if you are lucky, you can find them and be millionaire one day. One day, you no. Know? Yeah, it was so much history in that in that city, and still it is. No, we have uh, so many places to to go, and you feel you feel different. You can bring the the all living over there history. So, when you were growing up, was it still big on silver mining? No, 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 it was no more. But they have other type of minerals. They're still doing a lot of mine over there, a lot. Yeah. It, but there's no, like, in, in, in the time of the colony, was one of the most richest places on, on earth, like, compared with the um, Paris. And it was Potosi, the, the city. But now it's just a small town. Aren't the Bolivian emeralds? Really famous, or did I? There are some. There is a lot of places in, in all around Bolivia. Sometimes they they, they found the, the Amazons, uh, emerald mm -hmm. mines. Mm -hmm. uh, there is. We have also in Bolivia a lot of gold mining. Mm -hmm. uh, they have found some in the um, in the eastern part, also in the mountain side. Uh, what is it? Uh, steel, iron. They have a, a one place also in the um, a big mountain that has not been really mine but it's still there and this is uh, there is that now example there is one mining part and about sink in the western bank because uh, one of the biggest uh, tourist place right now is uh, el salar de uni is the lithium. big el oh, lithium right mm -hmm. lithium uh is this uh, dry salt lake in bolivia mm -hmm. el salar de uni so they are doing the lithium mining over there no so this a lot of different uh, between gems and other minerals that we have. So what happened in Bolivia is very interesting. 
after all this mine exploitation so far the country so um, the the folkloric of the the music and the dance at some point mix all this suffering in uh, for example in, in my part of, of Bolivia the Potosí the, they bring in one time a lot of slaves from Africa directly from Africa can you imagine in this cold and high altitude place so they died they died a bunch of them uh, uh, and the, after that, they decided to move it to the tropical side of, of Bolivia. And they just, they're still there. They almost, they, they don't mix it, no? Uh, they have a small community in Los Yungas, Bolivia. And they have their own culture, music and that. But with the, with the years, we, they fusioned their folklore with our folklore. So it was very fun. I mean, it's very special dance we call the Morenada. The Morenada represents the African slave. Uh, so it, the dance is very monotonous. This is very slow dance. A one, two, one, two, one, two, of course, choreography, and it, that's, that's the, the make a difference. But uh, the costuming and all the history is in, in the costuming and the, what is the history of the dance it is, because the costume basically represents the slave then it's shackles with uh, chains. So they also have like a, an instrument called matraca. It's a, a rattling instrument and goes rack, 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 simil, simil, doing the similitude of the chains and the world. So the costume uh, sim, signifies, example, like a, how much the slave was valued in those times. So depending on how much, how, how elaborated the costume is, is that not so. And all those uh, history and different dance, and then we have all, like she said, as Jenny says, like bringing from the mind, you know, like uh, the Diablada, also is another dance. Uh, then they say that they, in the mines, uh, in that time, the indigenous, especially indigenous from Bolivia, they were always asking for the permission of the gods of the underground mm -hmm. to go inside the mine. To be to be fine to be working there and to be protected and to be protected. So every time before they go inside the mine, they do a, a little ceremony, and even they have in the, in the at the beginning a little place like an altar with a it's not a door right it's like a, a figurine no mm -hmm. then it's similar to like a a devil no and so they offering coca or the coca cigarettes uh, something for. In the, uh, as a because protection. In, in, that in that time, it were, they were thinking when we outside of the mine, our mother earth, La Pachamama, and the, our god uh, son, the Inti, is uh, protect, us. protect us. But on the ground, we need to ask the help to the god, the of underground. The underground no? yeah. It is very, very interesting the, the folklore and the histories and all the dances. And we still also have. Um, some dances from the Inca period of time uh, and also pre-Inca time we still have a lot of culture over there. So you mentioned going to church uh, mm -hmm. on Sunday, I assume it's a Catholic yes. church? Yes, yes. yes. And how, how big is the fusion of, you know, the, the Christian beliefs and influence of the pre-Christian beliefs, kind of like you just mentioned, mm -hmm. you know, people still, you know, kind of, you know, remembering, acknowledging that yes. there are certain spirits underground, yes. uh, the, yeah. how, how do yes. you see that, you know, that culture fusion of, of different, different beliefs? It has, it's a little a fusion in there because, uh, of course, the, the, the official religion in Bolivia is a Catholic, you know, so that's, that's a, that. But uh, like when the Spaniards impo basically imposed to the indigenous the, the Catholic religion, you know, uh, of course, many of them refused to do that, so they punished them. But with the years, uh, most of the indigenous, uh, especially in the east and the western part, they, the Andes. they, the, the Andes, they kind of accepted and connected to, to their culture and to their belief and mix it up. No, like example, the 
the big carnival we have in Bolivia, then it's uh, of course in Mardi Gras in, or in the United States, you know, uh, we have like three days of carnival, you know, and there is a big uh, uh, parade, let's say, in Oruro, uh, last like two days or three days. Basically, it's all of the, these folkloric dances, Diabladas, Morenadas, Tinkus, uh, and all a bunch of other ones. But imagine like uh, hundreds of people doing one dance, but hundreds of groups doing that. So it's three or four days. And what the carnival basically is, they do a big dance from one place going to the, church, the main church in the city. So when they finish in the, on the front of the church, everybody just on their knees goes into the church. And what they do is basically they, they give thanks for what they have in that year or make the promise to the Virgin and to the, uh, to Virgin Mary. To the Virgin Mary, mm -hmm. the promise for the next year. You know? So that's the mix and that's the iron example. It says the only place in the world, then they say, the, the, the Diablos. The Diablos no? Go to church. Goes to church on their knees. <laughs> because after they, they dance with all this custom, they take they, they just take the mass and, and they go they to go church to pray. Because everybody do that. Uh, so the fusion is when the na native Bolivians mm -hmm. or all the native uh, Indian Andes people, um, they realize that Pachamama now changed the name. Is the Virgin Mary. And they got uh, Inca. Um, Inti now is Jesus. Yeah. That was the future. So that was an example of the, in, in the western part, like, but in the eastern part, with the, the mission missionaries came uh, to the, that area to all the uh, f, uh, Amazonian indigenous. For them, what was a little more different, they didn't resist it completely. No, at the beginning. But they actually absorb it, but they push their own way to do. Like example, there is a lot of missionaries from Europe, Poland, uh, Swiss, uh, uh, Spain, everywhere they came, trying to uh, getting like uh, the music part on the and the because they were musicians too. So a lot of these uh, indigenous they start doing instruments and doing music. So in the churches, over there, example, the, the, for the Amazonian part, they were more elaborated because they use their carving, the carving let me say, yeah. artistry no, to make the churches. Mm -hmm. So if you see the churches on the western side and the churches on the, Amaz on the Amazonian part, it's, it's completely different because the indigenous, indigenous, instead of resisting completely, they just try to, okay, let's do this. i show you what I have. And like example, one from that, uh, the eastern part, they, they have like a, a big festival, Baroque music festival. And it's basically because they, they just found a, a big uh, repertoire of Baroque music, but written by indigenous people. Right. It was yeah, written by indigenous people. So in the time that the missionaries were teaching the indigenous uh, religious and music and how to do instruments they start doing those instruments they start writing music and there is and there is a festival very very big right now over there you know, so have you heard that music that yes. they wrote is it um is it like a mix of, of Euro it is. european it is style because they, like they bring the um, the music for them to and they teach them how to to read and play the music but they they make their own interpretation and they have their own composition based mm -hmm. on that music. So and it is just <laughs> very oh, I would like to hear that. Yes, yeah, so they just it they is just very famous, famous, no? Yeah, they just they just found actually one of the those ones big uh, repertoires. Sí. So I'm pretty sure in a couple of years they're gonna start putting it back to the public, so let's see. So um, I wanted to go back to your families yeah. for a second mm -hmm. again. Um, what did your parents do for a living? Mm -hmm. Mm. My mom's history is very interesting because she's an orphan. She lost her mom when she was three years old. So she grew up with an aunt for a couple of years and then the aunt put her in an um, orphanage 
Orphanage, yeah. Orphanage with the nuns, with Italian nuns. So she grew up very, very educated with, with the Italian nuns, um, but poor because uh, in Bolivia at that time the situation it was very bad. So when she, she finished the high school, she went to work in the countryside as a teacher. And she worked with the people they just in, in that area speak Quechua, the, the native language from that area. So she has pictures and she was six, seven, 16 years old, or 17 years old, very young teacher. <laughs> And she said, my students, they were older than me. <laughs> but it was very, very nice um, experience for her. And then she met my, my father, who was um, doing, how you say? He worked. Trucking? Yeah, he, he drive a big truck from my grandpa. And he went to that, that area and met my mom, they get married, and then after she got three kids, she decided to study in the university. So she went, she studied accounting, and, and she was very proud. Now with three kids in Bolivia, where it's so machista, like you need to take care of your kids and that's it. She was, no, I'm going to university and study. So it is very uh, a strong woman, my mother. And my dad, very hard worker. Uh, he gave us uh, everything we needed. We are uh, four kids. I am the, the only girl and three brothers. But it was, it, it was very, they, they give us everything they couldn't give us, the best. Yes. Yeah, my parents were also from the, from the countryside, you know, basically the where my grand grandparents were, they they, they met in, in the same region, Limoncito and Santa Cruz. Uh, they always were working in different different things. Uh, my mother, my mom was a uh, modist. Uh, no, how do you call it? Sewer, sewing. Sewing. Dresses. Sewing dresses. No, she does. She did that as a profession. This means many things. Uh, working for different. Uh, companies in the cities or working at home all the time, you know. And my father was uh, working in different, different areas too, uh, from construction, uh, driving taxis, and he's, he's now retired. My mother just passed, passed away like uh, 10 years ago, you no, know, 10 years ago, but my, par my father is still, is still living in Bolivia uh, with uh, one of my brother. We have, uh, we have three brothers. One is uh, right now is uh, living in Naples, Florida. And my other brother is still living in, is still living in Santa Cruz, but uh, the good thing about my family, they were always, they were always close. You know, like my mom and her sisters and brothers, they were always being together uh, close by. You know? So, like every weekend with my parents and my uncles and aunts, we were having something together, or going to our grandparents' house, or in being in someone's house doing a, a, a small reunion, a family reunion, all, all the time. Not uh, just for celebrating somebody's birthday or just just for being with somebody. You know? it's a, like it's some in Bolivia, it's, we, you just can say one day, oh, I need, I want to go and go and visit my friend. Yeah, you, you just you, go. You don't make a... You don't make an appointment, you just, <laughs> just go. And, or, or if you're at home, sometimes you just open the door and it's like, oh, my aunt is right here. Okay, let's go. So let's cook a little extra food. <laughs> so it's yeah. that lunch time. <laughs> it is like that. No, so it's uh, that. So now, well, now, now my pa my father is just uh, retired. No, so it's, it's they say enjoying his life with his, his uh, grandson and granddaughter. So yes, he's doing good. Can you tell me about your education process? You know the schools you went to. Um, yeah. Yeah. Where did I? You want to start? Okay. <laughs> Ladies first. Ladies first. <laughs> uh, I was studying in a um, private school in Potosí, and it was a very nice school. Uh, it's, um, my friends from uh, from kindergarten, we went to almost the uh, ten grade together. So we are like a big family until now. We still call each other, we, we really love each other like a family. 
and growing up over there it was uh, a fun and, and like I tell you before I was doing ballet every single day after school so my mother told me always if you have bring me bad grades no ballet and I was crying and doing better finally my family moved to Santa Cruz de la Sierra I finished high school over there and I went to university I am an architect in my country I finished over there I worked for a couple years over there and then we came here <laughs> <laughs> yeah I started I went uh, I started in the public school you know and then uh, from first grade to uh, third grade like uh, as many places, many schools, they have uh, activities for the different celebrations of, of special holidays. So the funny thing is from that time I was always involved in some type of dancing and since kindergarten you know, over there. But uh, I've been lucky like in, uh, at the end of third grade there was a, a school that was doing a, like, a little, like a little promotion going through the different public schools, third grade and doing like an audition for the Canada, they say they say like for the three three best students for the third grade to go to this school. They say they're going to be a musical school or art school. So lucky me, I got into that. So it was it was nice because from fourth grade to finish high school, I think it's one of the best school I was I could be. You know, because. Uh, the same, it was like a family over there and we were involved in art since the morning, basically the whole day. You know, because it was a regular school during the morning but starting in the afternoon and evening there were the music classes, dance classes, uh, drawing, painting, theater, drama school. So it's, it was it was amazing. You know, so and as a family because we all we were like a, we knew each other the different grades, not just my uh, my classmates, but the whole school. We knew each other because we will meet other people in different different arts classes, and we will perform not only for the school and the, at the end of the year, but uh, different performances around the city. You know, because it was art school. It was that was actually one of the first art schools that was in my city in Santa Cruz. Now there is a lot of more places than it we can the the kids can have something like that and it's beautiful because i remember them uh, the in that time there was only well, our school was the only one that have like a small orchestra of uh, strings and it was very few because we didn't have too many instruments now in santa cruz there are like four or five symphonic orchestra and a lot of those they are being involved in those ones are part of the school and I was there, so it's ramified a lot and beautiful. So I finished that and then I uh, get into university. Uh, I decided a little of uh, computer information. Almost finished, but I have the opportunity to come here dancing, performing, so I'm here now. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, how did you get into dancing? Like I know for you, for you, Jenny, it was really early. You were just in the ballet classes, but what? Um, um, there must have been something that attracted you in dancing in the first place. And what was that? How did you get into that? In my part, I think that this uh, even perhaps I mentioned is even from first uh, kindergarten I was always drawn to or drawn to dancing because all everything what they were doing as a special event. I wanted to do something like that, you know. So, and we did art school, and I have what well, that was the most exciting part for me. Just doing ballet, contemporary dance, folkloric dance, of course. I've been involved in Santa Cruz uh, with the ballet folkloric called Sombrero de Sao. We then we traveled to Spain to do the big, the big, uh, the 1992 Seville Expo. No, we, we yeah, we we've been there with the, that ballet. We've been in Ecuador, in Brazil, uh, doing in Peru, doing performances, and all around Bolivia, doing performances with the Falei Folklorico Sombrero de Sao. Uh, that, uh, later on, uh, attracted to me the, by invitation of a school in Santa Cruz 
not to do flamenco and like okay let's let's see what it was so, so i like it and then we have the opportunity to come here to the state and you grow from there i mean see a lot of, a lot of uh, taking classes from different uh, maestros mm -hmm. you now from uh, we keep going mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what did that attract you to to ballet classes when you were a little child i was little and all my girlfriends they are going to the ballet so my mom say, ah, you are walking too much, um, looking down. I, you need to fix your posture. Go to the ballet. So I go to the, to the ballet and I love it. Because I was so shy. I, I was a short, shy girl. But when the time of performing came, I just transformed, I feel it. My cell was different. I feel it different I, and I love the lights, the stage. And, and until this day, I think, for, in my case, it's, it's like that. When I perform, it, it is different. It's no regular Jenny. It's, it's it is Jenny, very exciting. No? It's, it's very exciting. No? It's yeah. very exciting. It's for me, it's like a, every performance is, is it's not, it's not the same. You know, it's, mm -hmm. you have not, even, even if you rehearse many times the same dance, once you are in front of the audience, you no, know, it's it change the energy. You no, know, it's you have to change with that. Energy. It's completely it's, it's nice. And we love that feeling. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did you two meet? Where did you meet? Uh, we we so. we met in in Bolivia in Santa Cruz, but uh, we were more more uh, just dance partners. No. Yeah, he so was, you met uh, through dance. Yes. We met through dance. Yes, like uh, she was she was uh, dancing for a group Crear, and I was dancing for Sombrero Sao. And the first time we kind of meet was uh, a bit, uh, for one carnival in Santa Cruz. They, they make an audition. 50, 50 they, uh, they, they hire fifty dancers from, from the city to do one, have several choreographies for the for the big festival. So we were part of that one together, but. We just met in there. Huh? Yeah, and we be friends for a long time. Yeah, in partners and dance only. And when we moved to, we, we came here as a friends only also. Yes, and so you both got that opportunity to yes. move here. Yes, yes. What was it exactly? What well, we we were the, we were at at a, at a flamenco school, the same flamenco school. We started over there. We took uh, classes from different teachers too. And the cl the school was closing over there, so there was an opportunity of to come in here and uh, uh, work you know, as a as a dancer, and that's what well, we took it. And we are here. Yeah, uh, young, no, with the enthusiasm of say, let's go and find. Finally, we can maybe make some money dancing. Yeah, no, it was, because over there nobody pay you when you dance. It was more like a <laughs> like a let's we. We were thinking, bro. She was thinking to like a, a one or two years opportunity. Mm -hmm. It was for me the same. Okay, I'll try for once, two years, no. But uh, once we had here, <laughs> we got the opportunity to perform at Universal Studios for several years, uh, and, was, and seeing all the opportunities, dancing in different places, and mostly like a and meeting, yeah. meeting people from different Countries, backgrounds, yes. different backgrounds in. And the art, dancing art, so it was wow. That 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 was the best part. I was very impressed to. Mm -hmm. I never imagined to meet people from Morocco, Iran, Congo, all these exotic places for me, and or India, uh, and very very nice. All all of them dancers or musicians, but it was great, great, great. It was. It is. It is a nice ambience. Mm -hmm. No, with the. I mean, we've been lucky to meet a lot of uh, these artists and are yes, good-hearted. Si. No, good-hearted. A lot of them just help us out to grow with them, you know, invite us to perform with them or hire us to perform with them or in the same we do, working together. Or just referring people one to another one. You know, if they need somebody, a singer, a guitarist, oh, this guy, go, you know, this dancer. You know, like but that, in no? the end, when we have our sometimes parties, you no, know, and all these performers came to party. We find out we have a lot in common, not just the dance. Even in our countries, they are totally different. We speak different language. But in the end, we have the same 
the same love for family, the same um, ideas how you grow up together, the same ways where we play. Mm -hmm. We have so much things in common, so many. Mm -hmm. So what year did you move here? I came here in 1999. No, and and I came uh, and I come next year, 2000. 20, 2000. Yeah, mm -hmm. 2000. And when did you get married? 2001. Mm -hmm. 2001. Mm -hmm. Yes. That was fast. You came as friends and then. Yeah, she was looking for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one day. That's the official <laughs> version. <from laughs> <now on. laughs> yeah. It's easy. It's less, less do it easy. Mm -hmm. So when was the moment that you um, either make a decision or realize that this is going to be more than just a two-year, um, you know, contract, where you kind of like settled down and, and realized that I'm okay. going to make life here. Well, kind of the, the let me tell you the <laughs> immigration. <laughs> well, yeah, it was yeah. sadly let's like, say the 2001 mm. attack on the towers. It changed many things, you know, mm. because we came, I mean, we came like with the idea of being a few years, then let's say make our savings and come back and then come back again. So that was the main idea. But uh, with all those immigration problems that we have after is there was no way to just go back and come back in again to the States. So and, we, and the process and the process was, uh, was so long, so long time. You know? So we uh, we work on that and it's decide to kind of stay a bit longer and see how it goes. So every year we just wait for our final approval. Every single year for eight years. Yes. That's why we say no, no next year and no, no next year. That's why we get prolonged all the time. Our hope to mm. to get. I think it's that and probably because uh, uh, it was getting better for us. In the, in the artist part, mm -hmm. you know, we were meeting more people. They were helping us out, also dancing getting a lot, dancing you know. a lot. So it wasn't like we were, were not struggling in that section, but the struggling in the immigration part because we didn't got the waiting, the, the waiting part. The waiting part. It was that taking was very long too, mm -hmm. because we wanted to go and visit our friends and families and come back and keep going, keep working on here. But it was difficult. So it was eight years after. After then, we for the I first time we go and visit our families. You know? And in those eight years, you didn't have a green card. You just had the yeah. We have it our was like a permit. Yes, yeah, a visa, yeah. a working permit. So technically, you couldn't buy a house or anything. No, right? mm, you could no. just like rent. And yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we were renting most of the time, uh, and uh, I think it was 2005. Then were more easy for a lot. Uh, mortgage companies they were uh, doing like a of course down payment and you can buy a house and they help us out in, in that section we were able to get a house like that way no? so yes yeah. <laughs> but you know the the life as an immigrant is not easy it's, it's very hard especially with all the immigration papers you need to do and you need to do it because you need to be legal in this country totally agree on that is the the time you wait it's so long it's just and you you don't know what's going to happen and that, that part is, is just the most hard part of the, an immigrant the waiting part until finally they say no or yes <laughs> <laughs> so you can go back for eight years to we Bolivia. couldn't yes and that mm -hmm. time Ernesto's mom passed away, yeah. we, get, we couldn't go. And I didn't get pregnant also because for that situation we say, what about if they say no? And it, we couldn't do really nothing, uh, we couldn't buy a house or have a kid. Because it was no it is, it was sure what it was. It was the uncertainty okay. of the immigration. Mm -hmm. you know? We were with we were with the status of visa. It's no problem. We were legal here, but uh, it was it has to be renovated every time. Yes. There wasn't a, perm a permanent resident uh, visa. 
but uh, it's that that was a indecision from uh, that part. And, and you know, sometimes the you find a good people who can help you, and sometimes you help people they just want to take advantage of you, mm -hmm. and that's part of being being here as an immigrant. We we pass all of that situations too. But finally, after eight years, we say, okay, let's get pregnant. And if the answer is say no, we just go back. If they say yes, our kid is born here anyway. And that, that's it. So I get pregnant. My kid uh, born in September and our permanent uh, resident. resident came in October. Yeah. So it's good. Good year. <laughs> <laughs> Everything worked out. It worked yes. out, yes. Yeah. Um, what were your first uh, impressions of Orlando when you first came here? What did you think of this? Can I can I say this? Okay. It's funny. <laughs> when you, you go to McDonald's or Burger King, and you say medium size, and it's huge. <laughs> I, that was my thing. Everything was huge. Street huge. Food huge. <laughs> That was my first impression. <laughs> big, big, everything big. Yeah, for me it was easy. It was amazed because uh, I mean, coming from uh, from my city, basically it's to start working on Universal and seeing the parks, like wow, amazing! Now what's it is? And the way is, let's say, it's more organized. Yeah, just that's, that's the traffic example for us. <laughs> Compared to my city, it's just wherever you go. No? And here it's not there, and that's it. Uh, everything signalized, it was. And yeah, also, it was do, do your uh, driving license, no? Mm -hmm. So easy. Over there, it takes four days if you are lucky in my country. No, here it's organized. I love that part. Yes. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> yes. It was, I didn't even have driver's license back home until I moved here. So Yeah, yes. there's no way to, to transport if you don't have your, your yeah. car. Yeah, here in Orlando yeah. especially, if you don't have car, it's, it's difficult. I know, I for the first year and a half almost, I I didn't have a car. So like we would try with my husband, he would like drop me off here and then they, I would take mm -hmm. a bus, just a few stops mm. to my work. But like, yeah, I don't, I don't want to go back to that time. <laughs> yeah, it's the same for us. For me, example, like the first year I came here, uh, we were working on our, our visa. We did gather the visa for working, but, uh, but you, you just drive. We were driving bicycle. bicycle for almost seven months before I got my driver license. We had to I have because uh, at that time I had to. We have to be at least six months resident of Florida before you have a driver license. So after now, dancing and driving so bicycle? Was driving bicycle so everywhere, <laughs> coming here and then, wow. <laughs> you don't have to go to the gym or anything like no, that, or okay. exercise. Or <laughs> Just practicing and driving the bike to where you needed need to go, it's, it was fine. But yeah, once I got the, the, the driver license, yes. Yes. <laughs> I can go further now. <laughs> yeah, it gives you some, some freedom, sense of freedom, no? right? Yes. yes. Exactly. I remember my first time driving. Oh my God! I mm -hmm. it was like I discovered a different world. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, so, um, how did you feel? Um, is there a big Bolivian community here? There are many Bolivians in here in Orlando. According to the, the about to the consulate in Miami, they mm -hmm. uh, they say in Orlando there is supposed to be like two thousand or twenty five hundred uh, Bolivians. We just made maybe fifty <laughs> of those ones. Uh, I know it's many of the people is very busy working and doing stuff, so it's not time. But we have a small community then we get uh, yeah, together once to in together. a while. You know, like a couple mm -hmm. once. A couple weeks ago, we oh, three, three weeks ago, we met in August. In August? Yes, for the independ oh, Bolivian yes. independence. For the Bolivian, 
Bolivian Independence Day then is in August. Uh, there was a small community of Bolivian and they did a small meeting with food, everything there. And no, so our music, it was, it it was, was nice. very nice. We touched no, so. a lot and eat the food. Yeah, we do some things like that. But I know in, in Miami, example, Virginia, uh, and I think it's California, there is the community, the Bolivian community is huge. It's huge over there. So there's more mm -hmm. more events than they do over there. No? So. Is there a, um, like an organization here in Orlando? Like who organized that meeting? It's mostly example? friends. It's mostly friends. There is not a established organization. Mm -hmm. It's our official organization, but it's mostly, mostly friends. Then we call each other and let's do this, let's do that, and that's that where it is. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure in Miami and Virginia they have more official organizations than mm -hmm. they do that, no? Mm -hmm. So... Um, how did you feel welcomed here as, um, you know, dancers, immigrants, Bolivians? Um, how did you feel received by the community in Central Florida when you moved? I think it was it was nice. Mm -hmm. It was nice for us because so uh, is because it's multicultural. Mm -hmm. Like they say, it's a lot of diversity yes. around here. Uh, maybe because uh, the parks or Universal mm -hmm. Disney, the people is used to see different people different the dif different performers or uh, and, and also people. the work we do. No, we meet people from all of all different countries so we never feel like oh I, I have an accent nobody else is going to understand me because everybody, no, has because everybody talks <laughs> like us so it was it was it's nice I mean it's, it's yeah yeah it's it, it, it was very nice you know, to feel that mm -hmm. um, what about because there is a large uh, you know Latino community yeah. here but not everybody necessarily mm -hmm. um, see the difference you know people especially people who don't really have any connection with mm -hmm. any like people from mm -hmm. latin american countries they tend to you know just merge all yeah. the countries together right mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> yes so how did you feel that you know like an average uh, central florida resident their perception of of uh, of bolivia well, I think it's normal for them to just, like you say, marriage all the countries. If they, if they see us, if they will say, oh, Mexican, ole, uh, orale, orale. It's, it's normal for them, but and for me, for me especially, I say, no, I'm Bolivian. And say, oh, where is Bolivia? And I try to explain and it. It's, in general, most of these people is like, oh, really? Oh, nice. They, they like to learn that, no? So it's, it's nice to show them something different. No, it's in, in when we try to explain uh, where we are, or, uh, how is our dances from Bolivia, because we do mostly flamenco from Spain, you know? and they say, oh, and every time we do, we do that, they, oh, they see us perform and say, oh, are you from Spain? Actually, no, I'm from Bolivia. <gasps> Bolivia, what is that? So and we explain it, that no, it's, uh, it's being is is part of being uh, understanding from our part. To let them know what the difference, no? Yes, in, in I think areas. as a Latinos we need to do that to educate the rest of the population that we are. Yes, we are Latinos. We speak the same language, but sometimes between Latinos we don't understand each other yes. because we have different accents, different ways to say some things, mm -hmm. and uh, we need to explain that to the people so they can understand South America. We, we are kind of different, Central America and Caribe, uh, we're still different. different. And it's, I think, the part of uh, us as an immigrant, not uh, the first thing is not to get too much offended when mm. that happens. Uh, because sometimes we can get into the same deal if you go to Europe, like, uh, where are you from? No, it's like, no, I would like to maybe just first say where are you from and they say you are from there. No, that doesn't happen. But it's I think it's a part of us as I mean just not get offended and just let them know. Sí. You know to, the a little bit of the difference. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I feel exactly this. Yes. <laughs> it's when you really think about it, the world is so huge. It and is. Like something, you know, that is obvious for me, mm -hmm. from being from this part mm -hmm. of uh, the world, it's not necessarily that obvious. Like, why would somebody from, you know, the other part of the world is supposed to know exactly that, you know, Poland is here and then yes. mm -hmm. the Czech Republic is here. Like, it kind yes. of all merges into one. So, yeah, I got a lot of, like, situations like it that, too. It is, it is. Yeah. Um, what do you think... Uh, differs Bolivia from other countries in South America? What would be something that you th you think like is specifically Bolivian? Bolivia is uh, the heart of South America. Yes. <laughs> and everybody laughs when I say that. <laughs> but it's true. If you look the map of South America, Bolivia is in the center. And we, we have big Brazil in the west part and we have a lot of countries around Bolivia, no Peru, Chile, Argentina, Paraguay. Paraguay. Um, so we are really in the heart of South America, and for that reason, we have different um, type of um, culture, many languages, native language. We even as we are different. No, I'm from the Andes. He is from the tropical side. We speak different in Spanish. We have we grow up in different. Um, way. Uh, so it, it is different, it's very rich culture, very rich in folklore and they say the, the folklore of Bolivia now is a patrimonio de la humanidad, especially the carnaval of Oruro because it is um, it's the most colorful of South America. Mm -hmm. So um, speaking of, uh, about your, you know, career here, uh, yeah. your your dancing career. If you can walk me through, you know, you started as performers for, you know, uh, working for different projects and now you have your own school. Mm -hmm. So if you could walk me through that journey, how it all, you know, evolved, how did you get to idea of starting your own school? Uh, why is it flamenco uh, school? What we said well, our main uh, work here was when we came. We uh, was dancing. You know, uh, that that was our visa. You know, so we were performing uh, hotels, resorts, the parks, uh, different events. You know, uh, so we were dedicated mostly to that for many years. Uh, then after after many years, we. With, uh, and the people start asking us, us asking no? all the time, "What is your school? What is your school? Yeah, do you teach?" And so it's like, "Okay, let's let's try start teaching." So we start uh, with, uh, getting some students to the uh, getting involved in other other schools to basically rent a place, no, to, to do that. And that's the way we started doing having some students first. Uh, we did that for many years, and then we say. Our students uh, grew up, so we finally got the house with a small studio we had in the back. So we work on that. You know, so it's, that's, uh, and our, we start to run place. productions now with the students and also with collaboration with the musicians. Uh, we do our own creations uh, with dancing. And flamenco, why flamenco? Because um, for us, uh, I think it's our as our language, Espanol. No, Spanish is the mother, our mother language, and it's the same the flamenco. Uh, in here in Orlando, for example, for the conventions, they call us and say we want something to represent the Latinos. But if they put only Puerto Rico, it's just Puerto Rico. If they put something tango, it's just Argentina. So they say, okay, let's put it to Spain. That's why, you no, know, it's, it's, it's very commercial for it's them. For them. It's, uh, that's why we have a lot of work doing that. <laughs> <laughs> doing that. And it's a little, let's say, if, if we try to make more uh, the Bolivian dances, it is more difficult just 
technically hablando, uh, talking, speaking <laughs> in Spanglish, <laughs> no, technically speaking, uh, like example in flamenco with, with the flamenco style, uh, yes, my wife and I, we can do 20 minutes, 30 minutes dancing by itself, it's many different style of uh, music and the Spanish uh, range and the flamenco range. We can just and add a mantona. And we add a uh, few things. We don't need to exactly change the full custom. The full custom, no? And the Bolivian dance is more difficult because one custom is completely elaborated and it's you cannot dance dance. 20 minutes for just that, just to, per to people. To do something impressive with that, it should be at least many people. Because each to class meter. has different custom. No, so I have to change from each dance uh, a whole custom, so it's, it's, it's more difficult. But even like that, we, we do, well, for a special occasion, we yeah. do our Bolivian dances. Mm -hmm. yeah. for, for what occasions, for example? For example, it was a convention, a big convention, and they wanted something different. They don't want it, they didn't want tango or flamenco, something they, the people they never, never see saw. in Orlando. So we say, okay, Bolivian dances. So, so we, we put something like that, a few minutes here. And everybody we could change. Because the colors, the costumes, they are so colorful. Yeah. It's just what whatever. convention was that? I think it was a private convention right now. Sí, sí, but what is the, the, the international meeting or something? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was yeah, back, back ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we do a lot of conventions. Mm -hmm. Microsoft, sometimes they came to Orlando, things like that. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, from the time when you were performing at parks and resorts, mm -hmm. how did you how do you remember that time? Was there anything in particular that you would like the most or dislike the most from, you know, just like this... Um, you know the the in industry that the parks because the parks are like its own separate world it almost. Is. It is. So what is your memory? And the that? resorts when they call us for um, for, for dance over there, uh, my favorite place always is Gaylor Pan to to dance over there because they have the Castillo de San Marcos. They put us over there and it looks like uh, the Castillo de San Marcos San Agustin. Uh, I, we love to go to these um, big hotels to dance with. We perform almost on all of them. It is beautiful. The only thing is sometimes the people are closing the meetings or something. They are talking about business, they are drinking. And we are there performing and sometimes they, they are watching us and they are very impressed and the other time they are just doing business. No, that's the... <laughs> The feeling when you do that kind of perform. Mm -hmm. I mean, all those those places is like a, as she says because it's mostly conventions. So people they are ending their let's say, let's say their, their event and the 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 conven that part of the performances and the or the is the, the big party that they have. So some of them they become fired up to do something different than already being for one week in an office something like that or. Oh, they're just already completely tired of doing that. They just um, get over it. No? <laughs> so it's, it's funny to see them. No? It's, it's nice, but it's for the most part, all those uh, events are are amazing they no? because are. Yeah, because mm -hmm. you you have all those fun, all those uh, mixed uh, audiences. No, then it's never bored. We, we are never bored to see that. No, so it's it's good. It's nice. So. What about the physical side of being a dancer? Mm -hmm. you no, know, like, because it's it's a job that you have to be fit and ready yeah. to do. It's not mm -hmm. like you mm -hmm. know if you feel sick or you know? or if you go through pregnancy and yeah. and then having a baby. Like, how how does it work out? What are the strategies to you know to make it work for a long time? But mostly the the main thing is. Uh, Keep in practicing, you know, because so, uh, and sometimes happens. And if you stop preparing or da or dancing for a period of time, when you come back, it's really hard to get in the same energy. You know, of course, uh, sometimes we were we we have to 
dance through some sickness, right? Oh yes, no? yes. So yes. when you are with, with cold or you have a tooth problem or something, you just go and try to smile, smile with over. the pain. The I guess we were cool. mostly with is our mostly was uh, was and is still just my wife and I, you know, Jenny and I, mm -hmm. doing the performance. So it's difficult to find somebody to replace for one event just right there. So it's if we don't we, we don't feel up to the hundred percent, we have to do it. it now make it, it looks it, like hundred percent. It's but it's mostly the practice. So now imagine husband and wife, we have a fight, and we need to perform. <laughs> We just look each other. <laughs> <Get No. us. laughs> we do don't mean? fight. Normally we don't fight, but you have to. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and she danced through pregnancy too. I mean, she was she was pregnant. She was yeah, pregnant. I danced until one week before I delivered my baby. Yes. <laughs> Before I delivered my baby, I danced. Yes. And the was very hot. <laughs> I lost my balance a lot. But in, that, in that time she wasn't dancing really heavy stuff, yeah. it was more strolling, mm -hmm. just movements and it wasn't that a lot of footwork. Yes. No. Thanks God. No. But it was we were still busy, you know, doing some stuff but uh, so she was able to do that uh, until that time. Mm -hmm. Even the gynecologist was like, You still dancing? Like You yes. need to stop, you need to stop, <laughs> poor baby. <laughs> I, yes. So you, you touched it a little bit. Uh, how how was it to run a business uh, together as a married couple? Because it's more than just dancing. You run the school together. Mm -hmm. It's it's your. Um, what 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 do you think is the biggest challenge here? Or maybe maybe it's from your experience. It's something easier. To do. No, it's it's. It's, it's a pain, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's difficult, mm -hmm. right? Because so, uh, I mean, at the same time we have, it gets uh, times and we have the same idea and we come to the same idea and it's, wow, it's amazing, just get that one and, and do that, no? But sometimes we have completely different views of what we want to, to get for something is, and try to so we have to, to... No, listen, this is, part is better. It is, and that is, so it, it's ups and downs. You know, it's not always roses, it's not always you know, it's like that. It's, 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 it, but it's, it has to keep going. That's the only way to to find the, the point and where you have to decide we have to do it this way. You know what I'm saying? Right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Trying to think of how to ask that question. Um, so, how do you? Wh what is because you have class. You teach classes. Yes. That's one part of what you do. Mm -hmm. And then you perform to whoever needs, you know, a convention or some business mm -hmm. situations. Uh, but like throughout a year, mm -hmm. what is um, what is usually that you you know that you do? Is it like 50-50 classes and performances or is it mostly performances and then just a little bit of classes, you know, if, if you could give me a, like an overview of your activities. Well, performances and this season, this, that was 2021, is uh, starting to coming back for us because of the pandemic of last mm -hmm. year. No, everything completely shut down. I mean, so we have last year we canceled basically everything. I mean, <laughs> every week because we were performing every weekend somewhere and private parties and stuff like that. So everything shuts down. So now it's starting coming back for us. People, is special events, we start bringing performers, live performers, maybe no, to, for the for the events. Uh, so, but for for many years it was mostly performing. Okay. Yeah, for many uh, years it was mostly performances uh, and was every week. I mean weekends we were busy sometimes from Thursdays to Sunday, so or or Wednesday to Sundays. It's, uh, it was it was it was nice. Now you know? we are trying to do fifty fifty. Teach yes. more because we are growing. <laughs> And we want to also grow our school, 
and teach and prepare all these uh, people to continue. So job. when did you start, because uh, you have your studio back there at home, yes. uh, when did you start teaching classes? Um, we started doing more, when was 2000, 16? we started doing 2000, I mean 2008 probably, some classes around a couple of uh, friends' studios uh, to start getting more, uh, to start getting the word and we want to start teaching, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, then we uh, kind of remodeled uh, that part of the house to make it in a studio because it was what they call a Florida, Florida house, room. Florida room, yeah. you know. So we modified with the flooring, mirrors, decorating and everything. So in 2016, probably we start getting more students in, in this area in our home studio for, for that. Of course, when it's, uh, we have uh, we prepare the classes, techniques and choreographies in here, but when it's time to do big performances or productions, uh, we rent a bigger studio you know, to get all the students to do the rehearsal. No? So that's, that's the idea. But, uh, and yeah, so let's say 50-50 classes because of course we need to keep them practicing, you no, know, and accommodate our per, uh, the performances, you no, know, or special events in between what we have the classes, no. So what year did you open your school, like officially registered your school under 2016? the name? 16? Mm -hmm. 2016 probably, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, when you talk about bigger performances, mm -hmm. those are performances that you do with your students, right? Yes. Yeah, we did the, we did one in 2018. Uh, we called that one the Journey to Andalusia, mm -hmm. and we did one here in 2000 this year 2021 in May. Uh, that was uh, is uh, the Phantom, a flamenco story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The first one we did with our students is. It's an Easter example of a uh, Middle Eastern family that travels to Eastern or Western Europe, Spain, mm -hmm. and meets this flamenco, and there is a little mix in there. You know, so that's the history for that one. And then uh, the one we just did in May this year is an adaptation of the Phantom of the Opera, but with flamenco style dancing, flamenco guitar, and a little mix in there. Yeah. And uh, um, where do you perform when you have a show? Where what, what venue do you use? We did for those uh, two performances at the Sanford Theater, the Wayne Dench mm -hmm. Performing Arts Center. That's where mm -hmm. we did those ones. Mm -hmm. And the class, the, so people who perform, are they? Um, like almost professionals or they're just like regular people who like to well, we learn have, and we have our students that they have in the we try to get uh, to all our students uh, to participate somehow in the performance you know? uh, we have some dancers and they've been dancing before and they want to participate with us so we give them the opportunity to participate with us uh, there are many of our students from beginning, they have been working for a while, so we try to find the way for them to to work. Of course, they have to practice and make the energy for that. And so there's a different levels in there. Mm -hmm. But uh, our goal is always to try to get them to participate in the performance, so they get excited to keep going and, and learn. So what? What is um, special about flamenco as a dance that you maybe like, um, especially like about that dance? You do it? Okay. You first? And then you talk about the passion okay. of flamenco. <laughs> um, I like flamenco because you don't need a partner for dance, like a tango. I know, I love tango, I love it, but you need partner <laughs> in flamenco, no. You can dance by yourself. Um, I love the the music, and there's also a lot of fusion in flamenco. That's what I like it. I like the the Arabic touch the flamenco has, uh, the guitar, the singing. Your whole body works, even your fingers. 
No, because you do all this floreo we call with your fingers, no very kind of Arabic and, and, and you feel sad, you find a music and express your sadness there and you are very happy the same you express yourself dancing and the, the strong footwork. It, it really connection with the earth, not because you are there doing the, the full work and the customs, the customs, you know, the, the many colors, the ruffles, uh, the hat, the manton, the, the fan, the castanets, everything is a technique. Uh, no, you, you do different techniques, you use the, the, each one of them in different ways. It is a beautiful form of art. And it's very personal, no? I mean, uh, of course, as uh, many as many as dance styles or either any dance style, from folklore to ballroom, let's say, requires a technique in how you have to do that style of dance or that style of movement. But uh, some, somehow the flamenco is really personal because you can see and learn for many dancers, female or male dancers, but at the end is yourself and is expressing. And people see that, you know? You can be having an excellent technique and all that, but if from your feelings is nothing there, people is, don't see nothing, you know? And you can do like a small movements, but with all the energy you can, you have, people see that and you're like, wow, it's amazing. And you can sing all, all those different style of performance when you show YouTube, uh, whatever, whatever you can find flamenco dancers. Is, is that a personal way the, the flamenco shows in each dancer? You know? so that's, that's amazing. It's, I think it's something that you cannot sing other styles, something like that is. I mean, it's a lot of technique in other ones, but in this one, as she says, you can dance it by yourself, or you can dance in a group, and even if you're in a big group, you give your most energy, people will see that. It's like, wow, that's amazing. No, it's just mm -hmm. that. No, it's, it's that passion. <laughs> yes. Is flamenco popular in Bolivia? No. No, <laughs> it's not part of that. It's not. No, it's, it's, no, it's not. Not in Bolivia. <laughs> so in Bolivia, there would people would mostly dance folkloric dances. Yes. No. Uh, so no, what is yes, yes. But what is happening in Bolivia when I grew up, for example, in my ballet school, we did ballet, we did a classic Spanish dance, a little of flamenco, and folkloric dances from Bolivia. This all and mostly all the all ballet schools in Bolivia, they do these three categories. So we grow up doing the, the Spanish dancers because it's part of our heritage. So we already, it's, it's coming with us. You know, we are already training from kids. They, they already explain us how to play the castanets and the different type of dances, especially the classic dance of Spain. Well, I grew a difference as well. <laughs> No, because my, my school wasn't like a, like the, well, but it was an art school, but the dance part for us was mostly ballet, uh, always ballet, because ballet is the, the, the base ABC. for everything. Yeah, and that's what we tell everybody, if you wanna, if you don't feel comfortable with any other type of dance, at least try ballet for one, two years and see how you like it, and at least that's gonna help you in that. Mm -hmm. So my school was the ballet always, you know. But my teachers were more contemporary and modern, modern dance, so I did both of that. And through the years, I did have also a, a teacher that was a jazz style, so compared to mm -hmm. that. Then I did folklore, uh, to compared to that, a lot of mix in that, in that section for it. And later on, I, have, I found out the flamenco school in, over there, or the Spanish school in, in Santa Cruz, so it was more curiosity and I like it, yeah, so it's, it's different. Mm -hmm. but, but at the end, all this experience with the different type of dances help us here in, in Orlando because we not only did flamenco, 
we we did and we still do some folkloric Iranian dances. You no, know, it was just the some some friend told us, I need you to do these dances, can you do it? So we learned and we did it. And now we go and perform for the Iranian community sometimes. sometimes. And they say, after our dance, they came and they speak to us in Farsi. We say, I'm so sorry, I don't speak Farsi. But you look Iranian, you dance our Iranian dances. <laughs> Where are you from? And we say, Bolivia. They are just, they oh love my God. <laughs> <laughs> But, but the, yes, the ballet is the ABC of dance. No, if you do ballet, you after that you can really do any type of dance. That's interesting. So, um, what differences do you see in because um, Iranian culture is obviously very, very much different mm. from um, from Bolivia. Bolivian culture, <laughs> yes. right? Yes. And then from Spanish culture, yeah. uh, and you know, I'm not a specialist on history of dance, but you know, there is, as you mentioned, like certain meaning of each dance, mm -hmm. like there is a story. Yes. And so, what are the differences between Iranian folkloric dances and Bolivian dances, and I don't know, and the meaning of them? Well, similitude. There is actually a similitude mm -hmm. because all of the, the folk folkloric dances from the different countries, either uh, Bolivian or even Iranian, they express something for the region where they, they are. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, like a couple of the dances we do from some Iranian example is like a, a like a star a farmers no dances uh, like the rice harvester let's say I think it's the word so they are harvesting the rice and to preparing the meal to make a fest a feast for the for the for the community so something like that the other one that we do is like a a romance dance exactly. no it's like the the, 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 the female dancing and then the male comes and try to conquer the lady no and try to so have their her attention is like that and for Chloe dance from Bolivia we have similar to the dances too you no know, like the cueca is basically the same idea of the of, of that one there is other one like an Iranian it's more like a basically the male dancer showing off his baron aptitude you not know, doing uh, kind of foot movements and jumping and stuff like that is something like that is a similar to the Bolivian, Bolivian the some of dance, the Bolivian caporal dance from Bolivia. Then it's also the male dancer more doing more jumping in footwork to impress like, the to girls. Impress the girl, no? yes, it's, so it's, instead of being that different, it's a lot of similitude, just from different regions, different customs, the music a little bit different too, but it's, it's, it's amazing because it's, it's basically a it's storytelling no? yes. in both ways. Mm -hmm. I think that's the folkloric dance of uh, almost all of the countries. No? I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure mm -hmm. from every country. I mean, this, if we're talking about folkloric dances, is that because that was their way to pass their stories, no, through the years, no, through their, to the to the children, so no, so. Yes. So speaking of passing the culture and story, mm -hmm. um, what is the most important thing for you to pass on to your daughter? Um, you know, how how do you raise her to be aware of her Bolivian heritage and culture? When we try to, what, of course, with uh, once the first one is for her to learn speak different languages, mm. Spanish. They will, in the house we always speak Spanish, you no, know, for us so she understands completely. It's kind of difficult to speak it, but yeah, she's working on that. No, but at the same time we always. Uh, um, Talk with our families over there, or our our families over there, and often they tell at the beginning, like she was, she was uh, telling stories of the from the from Bolivia, you know, and she was always interested, and uh, in every time just trying to get like more in the culture, maybe the dancing, putting Bolivian music you know, in, the, in the weekends or something like that, just for her to know what is that and. Uh, the and meals, the no? meals, the yeah, meals she too. Loves the Bolivian food. So try, she say, she's learn learn a lot of the Bolivian meals, the dishes that we have. So try to get all of those ones and 
in getting involved with that. So it's it's passing all that. See, in all this time of the this, this month of the Spanish heritage month, they invite us to do a small it was a demonstration demonstration of just a custom. So, so I went dressed like a, from Spain, and my daughter went with the Bolivian one of the Bolivian customs. And she got very inspired and she told me, you know, Mamita, next year I want to do some dance, some Bolivian dance for this presentation. I don't want to just show the custom, I want to dance. Mm -hmm. So that's our goal, for her to, to feel very proud of being Bolivian, of being Latina, uh, and, uh, and, and also uh, share. With, with the school, with the people, everywhere she, she goes about our culture, their origins of where is she coming from, of Bolivia. Does she dance? She, she dance? dance with us, yes, she dance with us. Uh, yes, yes. He does, no, she does in the performances we do on the big productions. We, we have kids also, and, and, uh, and yeah, the school. In the school, we have set, uh, mm -hmm. get kids too. And yeah, sometimes with the school, she wanted to do something participate in, the, in their school events. You know, so. mm -hmm. And what do you think um, about, uh, you know, in Central Florida community, uh, the, the celebration of, of the Hispanic or Latino heritage? How do you feel about all those things that are the, the celebrations, festivals, events? What do you like or not like about them? Well, during that, well, now in this moment we are in the Spanish Heritage Month. You no, know, then it's it's nice because uh, especially Orange County is more involved in doing more events about that. Uh, Seminar County is not much uh, involved on in that. I mean, mm -hmm. they do some stuff, but uh, compared to Orange County, I think it's one of the counties that everywhere mm -hmm. is events doing, especially for this month. But uh, there is, because there is a lot of uh, Latino communities uh, from Mexico, Puerto Rico, Republic of Dominicana, and all yeah, the, and other ones, everywhere, mm -hmm. then they, they do events every time, you know? So there is a lot of, a lot of activities in, in their part too. You know? So it, it is nice, I mean, it's, uh, it's just... Uh, I think every year is growing It's more growing more. more. And of course, a lot, a lot of the more of the entities uh, are, are being aware of that too. So there is more activities, not only for the Latino communities, but uh, let's say for the uh, immigrants communities from different areas, mm -hmm. you know, it's from, from all the countries. They want to involve all the different communities from different countries to, to get something there. So get more involved in activities. Mm -hmm. it's, it's growing a lot, it's growing a lot. I was wondering, but I don't know if it's physically possible, but if you have any costumes here or equipment that you use for dancing and you would like to show me Ooh, or talk, talk about lot. it. We have a lot. A lot. Do you, would you <laughs> like to, because I would like to get it on the camera. Do you want to take the so, camera over there? Or we can bring some customs. Is there anything that you can bring or? You want from Bolivia or from different customs? Just whatever you would like to show me. Maybe from Bolivia. Maybe it's better go there and you see the. We can, we can, we can bring set, it. I can set a camera over there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that. Okay, yeah. perfect. Yeah. Let's, let's pause this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we are now in, in the studio. The Florida room the turned Florida into room. a studio to show some beautiful costumes. Yeah, this dress is a bata de cola from Spain. So it's the long dress. The long tail dress. The tail dress. It's very fancy. Mm -hmm. When you dance, you need to really kick the the tail, and it's a special technique for do the dance with this kind of kind of dress. This one is made in Spain. And for what is it for flamenco? Yes. Flamenco. Yes. For a special occasion, not for the special dance. 
Did you ever have a problem with that kicking? Because I can totally see this being dangerous. Oh yes, oh, yes, yes, yes. I fell many times practicing. <laughs> yes. Sometimes uh, the shoes get caught in the, the fabric in the, in the bottom part, so it's a. Uh, yes. Yeah. Wow. So. And sometimes you step on my bata. My partner steps on my yeah, bata. Yeah. Even accidents in that too. Yeah, it is. It is. It is. Yeah. But, but it's a fun. Fun custom, some fun dress to use it for for dance, and the people love it. No, it is. It's very really nice. nice. Yes. So you want to explain another one? Yes. Yeah, so also, like in Spain, you know, the, one of the customs we have is a, the bullfighter chaqueta. You know, this this one is made in Spain. You know, of course there. This one, and of course the bullfighter. The, the cape bullfighter, the normal bullfighter cape is, will be pink and yellow or red, you know, at the end. But I got one, make one just in blue, plus just to come uh, to match the there, something like that. It's why one of the cast. Why did you want blue? It's for the cast. For the cast, I have is to match the the jacket, the, the jacket, the jacket. Uh, I have this this time. Oh, okay, so you already had a jacket and you just wanted yes. to keep it. Okay. But it's just for the, for the show. For the show. For the purpose of the yes. show, yes. Mm -hmm. And we have some from Bolivia too. Yeah, this, mm -hmm. is the one, this example is a morenada. Morenada costume. It's a two pieces, in this case. Mm -hmm. It's like this. Here. So it's like that. And then it's kind of mask. Like this is the custom with the dance we were talking about this like a slow piece, a tan, tan, tan. But uh, like uh, depending of uh, this is a, just a simple custom, you know. It's a small. Uh, this uh, in Bolivia they make it bigger, more colorful, more stuff. You know, like say, like you see, like sometimes they have like pearls, uh, adornments, and everything. So the most elaborate custom that they, they say they say the. Because the more elaborated it is, supposed to be the slave was more valuable for for that uh, mm -hmm. that that time. You know? And like the the mask, one of the masks here example, you know, of course the black color signifying the, the slave in that uh, that time. Uh, and you see like example here the masks have like a, the tone out representing the the tiredness the, you know, of the of the people. And in, in the same the the eyes more or less. Look very tired. No, so that's that one in. Is this for a man or for a woman? This or is a for a man. This is a man's custom. No? And like this one, that's a one of simple matraca. And that's for a child or for this type of dance. So you say that that will be like a, the, what they say is the. This uh, representing the the rattle of the chains that the slaves were wearing at that time, no? and that would be the rhythm of the dance. Yeah. And can you read the blouse? Mm -hmm. This this one is um, a pollera skirt, very mini skirt from the Bolivian dances, and here I have a. Um, like Inca Adornis. decoration, adornments, and this is the blouse. We have the condor. The condor is the the national symbol of birth of Bolivia. Bolivia. That's the condor. So imagine this one. Of course, it's a lot of color. And hundreds of people with the same costume. It is just beautiful in the carnival. So for people who just like regular Bolivian people who take part in, in, uh, in, the, carnival. in the carnival, do they make those themselves? Do, is it like na natural for a Bolivian family to know how to make those costumes? No. <laughs> There is a artist. There is a lot of artisans over there, yes. and a lot of uh, people in work on that. So it's, 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 it, they have, we have a lot of people doing that. So normally a big group, a groupation of dancers. No, not really professional dancers. Just friends, mm -hmm. a fraternity, they call it. That, no fraternidad. They say, okay, we wanna decide the colors of our costumes of this year, and they 
find the person who is going to make for all of them the same customers. So they it just really professionalized and yes. Yes. they all just order. I mean, it's very detailed. It is. So yeah. I was wondering if anybody actually know how to, you know, if, or if it's a professional. The, the, the people who do the customs, they are really professional doing this. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is a lot of work. It is. Oh my it, it is. is. It is. Yeah. Do you sometimes have to fix the yes. ornaments yourself? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, we need to fix yeah, it. Yeah, yes. Because, because remember, each dance like this, just this one is like maybe a hundred people doing just this color. But there is other groups, like 20 groups doing the same style of dance, but in different design. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot, of, a lot of people that will be uh, making those customs and their companies. Mm -hmm. And mostly families now, no? they, they have their company that they dedicate basically the whole year in making those customs mm -hmm. because there's a lot of thousands of people dancing you know, because uh, these, uh, these companies and many families, they are not doing just one style of custom, they are doing different styles, maybe they are doing morenadas for one group, and they are doing caporales for another group, they are doing satincos for different groups. Yeah, like I want to no? show you the, one yeah. of the native customs of my area when I work, so I'll be coming back soon. Okay, sure. <laughs> So example is like a, there is one, uh, the big, the big, uh, the official carnival, you know, it's uh, mostly the, the, they say the, the people from the cities, the fraternities, the big friends, groups, groupations, what they do this big carnival. But there is also one, uh, the same season, there is one at a part time, then all the people from the outside of the cities come, you know, from the countryside. Then also they do the celebration, and they actually they families of people then they do their customs mm -hmm. for that time. Now mm -hmm. what you were asking about families doing their own customs, mm -hmm. they they do that because they, they live in the countryside far away from the cities, so they can they spend the year too while working on this on the on the, on the, on the, on the houses and everything, but they spend doing their custom for the next year, mm -hmm. so they are doing by themselves all the all the all this stuff. You know what? Uh, something maybe the custom is just gonna show you right now is there's something like that they were they were doing. And those uh, they also those ones are hundreds of people that's coming from different communities, let's say communities, and the and the outside of the cities, and they do that. Yeah. Oh. So like the communities, the communities uh, the uh, indigenous uh, from that side, example, they do customs like these ones. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So this one will be more like families and kids doing their own customs, you know, mm -hmm. to do something, to get to that big celebration. Yes, and they use the, mm -hmm. the Why is there a mirror in a hat? You know, that's a very good question. And normally they... Wasn't that because of the... I think also because they represent... The helps like the sun. Mm -hmm. They represent the, the brightness of the... the god Inti. Mm -hmm. And they separate the sun, the brightness. So because it reflects... Yeah, because they do so during yes. the day. You know, so the sun reflects in... Right. And they, they use a lot of mirrors, even in the costume sometimes they put the small mirrors also. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is very, it's for the dance of Tinku from the region of Potosí. A very native pre-Inca dance. Mm -hmm. It's very old. <laughs> it's very beautiful. I really love the colors. Yeah, and it's really warm. I mean, they will, uh, in, in the countryside of the, in the, where she is from, they will wear cats, dresses similar to this. More simple, of course, you see, mm -hmm. because it's really cold over there. This is yeah. warm, really it looks, warm. It looks warm, yeah. You know? So, but, of course, for the celebrations, they decorated a lot with this, and more you know, mm -hmm. brightness in, in the color. So. This is for the... The Ablada, 
This is the cake. So sad, you see. Yeah, for Chloe, that's from Bolivia, as I, as I tell you, it's very colorful. Uh -huh. and the masks. Wow. Is it for that celebration that ends with going to the church? Yes. 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 No, so that Maybe you can bring it. That is for the, 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 the girls' dance. So you imagine this one example, like, like I was mentioning with the conventions, it's difficult to make a long performance with just one costume, yeah. you know, to show something else because after two minutes it's kind of boring for them to say yeah, the same costume again, you know, it's difficult. So for that reason Bolivian dance will be more changing costumes, we to change or to something different to make it more interesting for the, for the audience to do, to see something like that. You know? So you brought all of this from Bolivia? Yes, this one is from Bolivia. Mm -hmm. It's from Bolivia. Wow. And we have a lot of them. Yeah, from the flamenco we have a lot. I mean, you know, different colors because we use that uh, most in uh, all of our performances, private events and like that. So we have different colors in the uh, uh, dresses, shirts, pants, uh, vests, and mm -hmm. all that. And the boy is coming. Hello. This is the boy. Again, this is a simple one, no? Small one. Of course, right now that they do more elaborated with lights. Very tall. Smoke. And so yeah, this is small, then I don't know. Yeah, this is, this is the small one. Yeah. <laughs> Let's say this is the old one. <laughs> <laughs> the new ones are really, really, really impressive. You know? It must be a little heavy. Isn't it, it is. I mean, it is. It, it, is, it is very hard to dance with a mask because normally there are small holes mm -hmm. and it's very difficult to dance. Yeah, with. and he has all that, uh, you know, mm -hmm. decorations in front of his eyes yes. on yes. top of it. So mm -hmm. yes. Wow. You know, this one is more famous for the, for the western side of Bolivia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. yeah, so I think that's it for the original. Well, thank you so much for showing no, me no, all no. of these. <laughs> I welcome. hope it's not going to be too much trouble to put it back now. Oh, no, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> So, um, maybe, maybe we can... Uh, just stay here because I only have one concluding question yeah. that we always ask at the end of the interview mm -hmm. uh, because we will hopefully have this interview in our collection for a really long time, you know, mm -hmm. forever as long as the collection exists. What would be the message that you would like to leave for somebody who may listen to that, you know, 100 years from now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think you need, for in my part, you need to always feel uh, proud from where you are coming from. Doesn't matter where are you from. And you need to express uh, your culture and teach to the people, let them know what is you are coming from. That's very important. And, and you, be, you need to be proud all the time because you have a place where you are. Race. It's, you are always unique. I mean, this room is you are always unique, and you are always will have something to show to everybody. You know, it's a, in the same time, you want to learn from everybody, and you have to show what you have for everybody to learn from you too. As an immigrant, it's, it's amazing what you can find in other people's, and to show and to learn too. So it's. It's very nice to share and learn from others, yes. That's the best part of being an immigrant. <laughs> well, thank you so much. You're welcome. I will stop now. Mm -hmm.